when Nathaniel began to sing about fresh revelation coming, I felt the Holy Spirit say, reach up and come up. I will pull you into another dimension of revelation for we've been operating at one level. And he says, I've trained you in this level, but it is time to step into the next level for you've been trained at this. Do not stay where you are, but come up into a higher dimension of revelation. For when you come into the higher level of revelation, you will have a revelation of my faithfulness that will take you above and beyond the current obstacles that are in front of you. For the Lord says, you see many things that are swirling around. You see many things that cause fear to arise. But the Lord would say to you that if you will come up higher, I will reveal to you that which you have not yet seen, but it will be what is needed to infuse you with a bold and courageous faith that will not shrink back, but will surge forward and you will cut a path into the future that others will follow behind you but you must come up into a higher dimension of my revelation for even as the angels circle around my throne and say holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty they say holy and a fresh revelation every time they see something new they say holy 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 and the Lord says come up higher I will show you things about myself that you have not yet had the capacity to imagine for I am above and beyond what you have known so reach up and come up higher so father I loose over your people an ability to soar higher in the spirit to come into a new place of wisdom and revelation that they will come up over the obstacles from the youngest child to the oldest saint. God, we come into a new dimension today to come in to a greater revelation of faithfulness. If you receive that, shout unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. You will notice some of you are new that people just spontaneously began to come and give. And just because we've got so many new ones, I want to just explain what's happening. See, we are training ourselves to not wait for the invitation to give, but to come into worship prepared to give. And when the Spirit of God moves upon us, that now's the moment, then we just come. Because see, when... Giving is connected with faith in obedience and in love. It in unlocks whatever has been released. So if there's revelation that's coming, whether it's during worship or if it's during the preaching of the word, when that revelation hits you, move on it because what it will do is it will unlock and secure that revelation in your spirit man so that you can take it and grow with it. How many of you want to grow with the revelation? I want to grow in whatever revelation God is loosing. I want it. I want to hold on to it. I don't want what God is doing by the spirit to be lost in my life or in our lives. So Father, as we continue to worship, I say, God, stir in our hearts fresh revelation, fresh understanding, an unlocking of faith that operates by love, that even in our giving, in our singing of songs of praise, our waving flags, our dancing, our obedient actions with you, that everything we do, God, brings about an increase for the advancement of your kingdom. So, Father, we thank you. Father, I bless everyone who gives today. I bless them with a multiplication of revelation, but also a multiplication in their finances so that they might be able, loosed, unlocked, 
to do all that you've put in their heart, that even in trying times, and most assuredly in trying times, that you would unlock such provision, God, that we would become the storehouse that then provides for the community, the storehouse that provides for those that don't know you, that it will be a key to unlock their hearts for the gospel of the kingdom, that they may come in to know you and the harvest may increase in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's keep worshiping and let the king be exalted in all. Yesterday as we worship. I saw the altar of incense in our midst. As the incense burned, smoke went up, a sweet smelling to our Lord. I see that altar here today. Let's worship because our worship is that incense that's a sweet smell to the Lord. that Jesus said was suffer not the little children to come unto me and we are celebrating having children come and not just to come into the house but to come and be trained and equipped activated and commissioned to minister come on that is special. If y'all will just come in, in the order that you're listed, because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to get really messed up. Oh, hey, precious. I love these kiddos. For the last nine weeks, I think it is, um, these children have been trained in healing room kids, been trained to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. They've been learning how to be still in the presence of God, go into their own secret place and learn to hear and to see from Holy Spirit. I know some adults that need some training <laughs> but these little ones have been listening and watching Holy Spirit move drawing what they see writing what they hear I don't know about you but I wish somebody had trained me in that when I was a child and I wouldn't have had to wait until I was older and unlearn a lot of stuff so that I could learn because religion taught us a lot of things we had to unlearn so that we could learn from Holy Spirit that yes, He does still speak today and He speaks in dreams and He speaks in visions and He gives us open revelation. He speaks in the innermost parts of our being and He wants to move through all of us. You know, children do not get a junior Holy Spirit. I mean, come on. The same Holy Spirit that dwells in you dwells in every one of these children. So I'm going to come down. We are uh, commissioning them to be ministers of the gospel in the Healing Rooms Kids Ministry. We're giving them a, uh, a prayer shawl, and they will be anointed. And this morning, Holy Spirit's really good. And y'all say he's really good. Well, I got the list of names of all these kids this morning at about 10, maybe a little bit before. And I said, Lord, I want a verse to give to each of them. And as I looked at every name, he told me what verse to give them. So I didn't have time to think about it. I just had to give him what the Holy Spirit said. And that's a good thing. I want you to um, 
This is Kathy Nash. She has been doing the training and the healing room kids. And Joan uh, is on the end, and she is our children's pastor and been working with these kids and working with them, not just with the healing room, but overall with our curriculum and training our teachers. We want our kids fully trained and equipped in the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Because what happens when they keep going? They're going to lead the way. And we're doing this so they can lead the way, but also so they will be protected in the midst of a dark world. Because they know their God and they can stand. And because those that know their God, they will do exploits. So, Father, even as we begin, we extend our hands to these young ones. And we say, we are so proud of you. And we're so grateful, Holy Spirit, for the work you're doing in each of them. And I decree over them that they are mighty ones in the Spirit. And they will do exploits. They will see signs, wonders, and miracles following them as they live faithfully to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for them. All right, McKinley. I have to get my hug. I always get a hug from McKinley. She's my sweetheart. We commission you today. And the verse the Lord gave me for you, McKinley, is Acts 4.31. As they prayed, the earth shook beneath them, causing the building they were in to tremble. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they proclaimed the word of God with unrestrained boldness. <laughs> Ariana. This is Ariana O'Connor. We commission you, and the verse the Holy Spirit gave me for you is Philippians 2.1. It says, look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one, with Jesus. You are filled to overflowing with his comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection, love, and mercy. We love you, Ariana. Oh, you what? Okay, you can give it to me later, okay? Okay, Haven. Today, we commission you to minister in the name of Jesus. And the verse the Lord gave me for you is Psalm 42, 1 and 2. I long to drink of you, O oh God, to drink deeply from the streams of pleasure flowing from your presence. My longings overwhelm me for more of you. My soul thirsts, pants, and longs for the living God. I want to come and see the face of God. All right, Jet. And for those who don't know, Jet has a new baby brother. <laughs> I couldn't resist. And his dad's on the drums. Jet Milner, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Walk in the wisdom of God as you live before the unbelievers and make it your duty to make him known. Let every word you speak be drenched with grace and tempered with truth and clarity. For then you will be prepared to give a respectful answer to anyone who asks about your faith. We commission you into the ministry. Yes. Emma Booker. This is Betty's granddaughter. And we commission you today, Miss Emma, with Matthew 6:33. This one came so strong for you. Lord said, so above all, consistently seek God's kingdom and his righteousness then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Seek his kingdom, sweetheart. Another Ariana Nash, and this one belongs to Kathy on the end. 
granddaughter. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do and he will lead you wherever you go. Aria Flock, another one of the Flock girls. <laughs> Commission you, Healing Room Kids. And the verse for you is Psalm 96, 1 through 3. Go ahead, sing your new song to the Lord. Let everyone in every language sing him a new song. Don't stop. Keep on singing. Make his name famous. Tell everyone every day how wonderful he is. Give them the good news of our great Savior. Take the message of his glory and miracles to every nation. Tell them all about the amazing things he has done. There's a lot loaded in that for you, sweetheart. <laughs> All right, Lucas, and you are up sounding the shofar for us today. All right, thank you for doing that. It was awesome. We commission you into Healing Room Kids with Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5. Be cheerful with joyful, joyous celebration in every season of life. Let your joy overflow and let gentleness be seen in every relationship for the Lord is near, and I'm going to say, He is near to you. Braylon, it's an honor to commission you. Expecting great things, great testimonies. Such a sweet spirit. You've got Ephesians 4, 1 through 4. It says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank and given to your divine calling. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. Be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace, being one body and one spirit, as you were all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. God bless you. And finally, Selah. Yay. It's interesting, Selah's been with us since she was about the age of the youngest one up here. I've seen you grow a lot, my sweetheart. And for you, it's Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. So then we must cling in faith to all we know to be true. For we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us and now sympathizes for us in our frailty. He understands humanity, for as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way, just as we are, and conquered sin. So now we draw near freely and boldly to where grace is enthroned, to receive mercy's kiss, and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. You're going to not just be strengthened, but you're going to strengthen strengthen. So would y'all extend your hands? If all of our healing room kids would stand, we're going to extend our hands over you and seal this. Father, I thank you for this first fruits offering in this house of healing of healing rooms of healing room kids. Father, anoint their hands with the grace of healing virtue. Let them see signs, wonders, and miracles follow them as they do as you command them to do, as you reveal 
what you want done. Let them be anointed for the task at hand in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Lift up a shout of thanksgiving. It's awesome. Y'all may be seated. What I feel like the Lord has said to me is the kids begin and the rest of us follow. So that we're all moving in a greater measure of healing anointing. Um, just a couple of announcements, and then we want to get our special guest up this morning. Um, I'm announcing today that on December the 10th, Sunday, December 10th, Clay Nash will be here with us. He's going to be in the um, helping with a wedding over in South Carolina, and so we said, why don't you just come on over and uh, join us for Sunday morning? So I'm excited about that. We will have Advancing Faith, our class at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. Revival prayer at noon on Wednesday. And don't forget the uh, prayer call every day at 222 and then on Friday nights at 9. And this next weekend, Friday and Saturday, um, if you will go to claynash.org, the Josiah Company Conference, uh, that is the people that are coming gathered from the prayer, daily prayer call, will be gathering at Glory of Zion next week. Next weekend, I will be there. A uh, number of others from here, I believe, are going out as well. But if you're not there, you can watch online and be a part. So it's really strategy. Chuck Pierce will be speaking, Dutch Sheets, Clay Nash, and some others. So uh, be a part of that. And let's get equipped and prepared, even prophetically prepared, for how to move forward in the days ahead. Because we're in some very interesting times um, very challenging times in our nation and in the nations of the world. So I, I encourage you, press in on your prayer life. Make, make extra time. Give yourself to opportunities to gather with others to pray. We have got to have a surge to get, brings us into the breakthrough of awakening that we're all looking for. We're seeing pieces of it, but we need to move into another dimension. Did you see some of the posts this week about Nicaragua? As many as 650,000 people gathering in worship and thousands and tens of thousands coming into the kingdom of God. If there, why not here? Come on. I want to see it everywhere else, but I want, while on others, you are falling. Don't pass us by, Lord. Don't pass us by. So... Just keep praying. I know it's coming. You can feel it. And thank you for everybody who came out yesterday up to Barge Farms in Kingston. It was cold, but only in the natural. It was fiery in the spirit. It was awesome. Thank you. Worship team, you guys did an amazing job. Trey, you pulled it together. Even with uh, technical glitches, it was still amazing. And um, just watch for us. We'll be doing another one somewhere. Just don't know where yet. So Kevin and Rose are no strangers. In fact, they're family in this house. Um, we have, Kevin and Rose and I have been friends now for almost 20 years. Uh, met in the fall of 2004. It's hard to believe. We were so young at that point in time. Uh, we're still young, right? Um, but we are... <laughs> We are honored that they're back with us. We have had an incredible week with the return of the Chiefs. The gathering downtown was amazing. And then down over at the Peace Park with the planting of the tree. Just in, an incredibly significant prophetic time for our state. And I expect there's going to be more to do. And then they joined us yesterday. I also want to have Sharon Pedlow and Paul Best. If you would just stand and turn around and greet everybody. Um, they've been with us before. Paul um, is an amazing historian, etymologist, uh, health person. I mean, I don't know how long your resume would be if we really started laying it out. Um, but we're honored that you are with us and that you came over. But Kevin and Rose, if you would come, we are so blessed that you are here today. I want to, if you'll grab the microphones right there. You can each have one if you want. Oh, they're sharing. Okay. 
Well, y'all, one more time, extend your hands. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Father, I just want to bless my friends and thank you in advance for the word that you have given them to release to today in this atmosphere and to us. Father, we say we will take what you release and we will work it and we will move with you. So, Father, bless them with an open heaven. Fill their mouth with words and wisdom. Let the anointing break every yoke of bondage and let the purposes that you have for them today and as they continue their travels to be fulfilled in abundance in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Am I, yes, I am on. I was going to say, am I on? I, I don't actually know if I am on or not. You know, some mornings you wake up and you think, am I awake? <laughs> Today happened to be one of those days. And you know, some days we can bluff you as leaders. Some days as leaders we can come in here and go, morning everyone and how's everyone? And then we can do all that stuff. This morning has been a fight. I want to say to you all, this morning for me personally has been a massive fight to get here. It's been a fight because the enemy does not like me. He does not like me in your territory. He does not like the word of the Lord that's going to be released. He does not like the things that have gone on this week. You know, we did some amazing things this week in the spiritual realm, all of us. And the enemy's going, really? Well, look at you. Let's see how you deal with just the little incidental things. You know, when you can't find your socks. <laughs> I can't find my socks. I found my socks, Sharon. But I hadn't found my socks for two days. My feet were freezing yesterday. <laughs> freezing. But praise God, I was there. You know, simple, silly little things. That when you're looking through your suitcase, you suddenly go, ah, oh, for dear sake. <laughs> you know, you get all agitated. But you see me up here going, oh, praise the Lord. I was not praising the Lord this morning, people. Just being really real. In the bedroom, I was not praising the Lord. I was as grumpy as get out. And I thought, what is wrong with me? But then we were driving in here, and I seen a billboard. And it's some silly advertising billboard, but there was a spider on it, and there was a web, and it says, we are in the web. No. I'm in the car, and I went, I'm in no web. The spirit of deception that is trying to come against me this morning to get me all tangled up and all caught up in that stuff that I can't even move. It's coming off me now in the name of Jesus. And I want to thank Nathaniel and the team. I mean, yesterday, Nathaniel, I have no idea where you are in this room, but yesterday I couldn't even contain myself with the tears. The worship anointed on your life is incredible. This morning was the very same. I thought, nice, stop it, Rose. Just stop crying because you're getting up to minister. Stop crying. <laughs> Such an anointing on your life to bring the peace of the Father, to remind us of who we are and whose we are, to remind us of our past victories. I had it all going on there this morning, remind me getting the past victories. God's with me. Why am I feeling like that? I have no need to feel like this. I'm his daughter. I have the daughter of the king. I get to crown the king. I mean, come on, think about who we are. So all those little agitations this morning that some of you may or may not have had on the way here, let's just shake them off. We're not in no web. We are in no web in the name of Jesus. But it's such a blessing to be here uh, back with you again. It doesn't even feel like a year, I guess, since we were here last year. But we do love to come uh, to City Gate. We are grateful for your apostolic mother of the house here, grateful for her wisdom. And, I'm sh and you're blessed to have her here because, you know, I never forget that. Never forget that. Is she going to annoy you? Yes. Okay, we're not, we're not even going to pretend about that one. Is she going to get in your face? Yes. Is she going to get under your skin? Yes. Is she going to point you in the right direction? Yes. Is she going to pray for you in the middle of the night when the Lord wakes her up? Yes. I mean, these are things that, as leaders, people don't understand, that we love them and want to see the destiny unfurl before them, see the bigger picture. And, and all of a sudden, that can look like control. It can look like, oh, the Jezebel spirit. Listen, let me talk about that Jezebel spirit. That, she's nothing. Absolutely nothing. You've got to look at her daughter. Her daughter's moving on this earth right now. Stop talking about Jezebel. Start looking at Athaliah. 
Athaliah wants to take you out and take everyone around you out because she wants the throne. So don't be moaning about Jezebel who just has a bit of a control issue. <laughs> Start looking at the other lady. But anyway, that's nothing to do with nothing. Because uh, you're in the prophetic house, there's multiple ways I could have went here this morning. In fact, I'm just going to... I'm just going to go here with this word. Um, this is what I got. And the Lord would say to you, live in a state of readiness, in a position poised to move when he says move. Oil lamps ready to light the way. It's time to fill your lamp with fresh oil. Time to check the wick is ready to burn. Is your wick ready to burn? When the matches struck, we struck some matches yesterday. And I actually smelt smoke yesterday. I don't know if anybody else smelt that smoke up there at the barge, but I smelt smoke. Poised and ready to burn with holy fire for the kingdom. Time to be seen. This is a time, people, where we need to be seen. You can't be hiding your light under a bushel anymore. We need to be seen in this world. No more half-hearted saints, but saints full of passion and desire to fulfill the kingdom call. Ears and eyes pure. We could stop right there. I could stop right there and say, what did you watch this week? On your TV, as you were relaxing. Was it all pure? Or did your eyes look at some stuff that it shouldn't have looked at? You know, we've got to get really focused people. We've got to get really focused. Sometimes you have to turn the ads off. Yeah, <laughs> turn the ads off. Yeah, right. There's where we need eyes and ears pure. What were you listening to? Who were you listening to? All the negative stuff that came at you this week. Just stop them. I had to stop a lady a few weeks ago, and I said to her, sorry, that's my friends you're talking about. She was talking about my friends. How rude. So I had to stop her because I couldn't allow myself to be contaminated. Yeah. By what she was saying. So saints, the Lord says, look again. Look in. Are you ready? Are you living in a place where the fire can burn freely? Are you positioned to light the way for others? Are others looking to your life and going, I want to live like that? I see Jesus in them. I see eyes of fire burning in them. Or are we is the chameleon coat on you too often? Are you living in a place where the fire can burn freely? Are you positioned to light the way for others, burning ones for his kingdom's sake? Live ready. The master is coming. I mean, it's a simple word, but it's a deep word. Gosh, we've got to look at that and, and say, oh, am I really ready? Am I ready to go when he says go? You see, the thing about it is, this vineyard's not for sale. Amen. This vineyard. Yes. Amen. We can say this vineyard. We can say that vineyard. We, but this vineyard, it's not for sale. And you know, when you look at that story, this has nothing to do with what I was going to share, but anyway, when you look at that story, you know, when he went and said, look, I'm going to give you something better. I want to give you something better than you had. It looks good. The temptation. It looks bad. The position could be better than what I have now. Hmm. Maybe, it's, maybe I could sell it. Maybe I could let that go and just, well, you know, take a day off. And then he said, this vineyard's not for sale. Why? Because it was to do with his ancestors, those who are coming behind. Every decision I make today affects not just this but it affects this, the unborn. It affects the unborn. So if I compromise today, and people, I've compromised in my life. I'm not no angel. But I'm saying I'm trying to live my life with eternity in, in my gaze. I've changed the way I think or used to think. Deliverance is wonderful. So every decision that I make. So what did he do? He went home and he huffed. He sulked. He got into bed. Huh, wouldn't sell me. Wouldn't sell me. I'm going to use manipulation now. Wouldn't sell me it. I was wanting to give him more, but he just wouldn't take it. People around you can make you feel bad with their words, with their actions, with their silence. 
They can make you feel bad. But today, we have to make the decision that says this vineyard is not for sale. It's not for sale. And no matter what you feel like, the vineyard is not for sale. There's no compromise. There's no gray area. We can't afford, there's no middle road anymore, people. It's black or it's white. You're seen or you're not seen. You're going or you're not going. That's what we're, we're living in the season that we're in, people. The choices that you make today affect the unborn coming right after you. Your generations. Don't go selling your vineyard for something just to keep somebody happy because you might just get something better. I'll tell you what, your better will be ruined in a moment. Your better to keep everybody happy will be ruined in a moment when they turn and say, hmm, I don't know you. Listen, our God is looking for a bride that has made herself ready, that lives in a season of readiness, that's ready to go when the match is struck. That's a burning one, full of passion, full of desire for the things of the kingdom. Ones who are pouring themselves out so that he can pour in. God is faithful to our yeses. He's faithful to our yeses. People, we have choices to make every single day. And we better in this awful world, in this chaotic world that we find ourselves in, we better say yes to some and no to others and not feel guilty about it. Well, I was going to read all of that word that I got, but I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to go right towards the end. I'm going to pick out the two things that re the Lord really spoke to me about. I always ask the Lord, you know that. I always come for a year, a word for... The, the year ahead, and it was a very long word the Lord, the Lord gave me this year for the year ahead. I'll give it to Jackie, and you can take that. But in the word, there was encouragement, but there was also caution. And I think we need to be cautious in this season that we're living in. But a few things that caught me from the word that you will read later uh, is, what, is the Lord said this. He said, I'm raising up a Jonathan company. Now, Jonathan means gift of God, or God has given. So basically, God is saying to us in this new prophetic season that we're in, in this new year that we're walking through, the double gates of favor, hallelujah. He says this, he said, I'm raising up Jonathan's men and women of integrity, of purity, of selflessness, ones who will warn us of evil. Ones who will course correct us through a heart of compassion and love. Ones who are full of faith, devoted to God. Ones who walk in the supernatural life, hearing God and moving in swift obedience. God will reveal these soul friends. You see, Jonathan was a soul friend. The Celtic people called them Anam Karas a teacher, a companion, a spiritual guide, but it wasn't just one way. A soul friend was a two-way relationship. A person of great trust, one who, you would always, who would always watch out for your back. One who was obedient, trustworthy, a visionary against all odds. This is Jonathan's. These relationships are founded on connections, authenticity, trust, and respect. You want to build relationships like that, people. If there's anything more important than this season, it's strong relationships. You need to know who you're going to war with, not just lunch. And this is especially needed in this season of transition that we find ourselves in. So the faithful Jonathans are being raised up. Raised up without the spirit of entitlement. Is anybody tired of that thing? 
Jonathan knew who he was. He was next in line to the throne. Saul's eldest son, he was a warrior. warrior. He was fearless. Even in the face of battle, he knew what was needed and when it was needed. Boy, do we need the Jonathans in the body of Christ. And when he met David, the verse, if you read it, says, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. How lovely is that? First encounter, you just, wow. We've all had people like that. We all know people like that. We all love people like that. I've had that so many times. Jonathan will show us, really, I believe, that Jonathan's will show us what honoring and preferring really look like. Really look like. Not, no, go ahead, have my seat. I don't believe they get to give her that seat. <laughs> you know, we, we, we bluff this thing that all that doesn't go on in there. Let me tell you, it goes on in there. Just get real <laughs> and repent. <laughs> Even when his father in 1 Samuel 20, 30 said, he spoke to him really harshly. He said, your kingdom's not going to be established. In other words, who do you think you are? You're going to, your kingdom's not going to be established. That's his dad speaking. Even when he heard that, he had a choice, and he still remained faithful. He still remained caring. He still remained protective over David. After hearing that, you're getting nothing, boy. Didn't matter, because his soul was knit. There wasn't a, what about me in sight? You know, like Joyce does, Joyce Myers says, people wind themselves up every morning, you know. And then they go about, what about me? What about me? What about me? All day long, you know? We all know those people. Not a what about me in sight. Jonathan didn't have that. You know, it's like, Lord, help us be faithful, Jonathans. When the Lord said he's raising them up, it was almost like, let me be one, God. Let me be one. Help us to know them, to discern them, but help us listen to them. You know, just when I said that listening to you, I thought about Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell, you all know that, this, this, the, well, uh, the Hebrides revival. We Peggy, a lady of 86, was blind. She was a prayer warrior, prayed in the revival, basically. But I love Duncan because she said to him, one of these things she said to him, she was praying, and she said, I think you've got to go to this village. And he basically said, no, I don't feel that. And she said, well, well, Mr. Campbell, if you knew God how you should know God. He was a minister back, way back in the day. You wouldn't have spoke to your minister like that. Well, you, would, you shouldn't speak to your minister like that now. But she did because she heard God. But his response is brilliant. He went. He went and revival hit the village. There was no pride in the man. He didn't go, who on earth is this blind woman trying to tell me what to do? I hear God. He listened to her. And sometimes we don't like what Jonathan's will say to us. But sometimes we've got to step back and go, now wait, God, is this really you? Because maybe I do need to sort myself out. <laughs> maybe there is something in me that they're saying that I don't, you know. The second thing that I love in the word is this. He said he's raising up hubs of habitation. And this is a hub of habitation right here. Worship hubs filled with his presence, altars of fire and glory. We've been talking about altars of fire and glory for a while, but I'm telling you what, when he said it, he was building this hub of habitation. And because of these places, we're going to see, he said in the word, that we're going to see breakthrough in each city and region and in the nations that yield. Purity and humility at the heart of each altar. So you can have an altar if you like, but you can say, oh, my altar's burning brighter than yours. Or you can have purity and humility and go, we're burning God for you. It doesn't matter the size, but we're burning. Glory carriers expressing their praise to the king alone, crying out, not unto us, O God, not unto us. That was in the word. These thin places where heaven meets earth. Safe havens for people to come to. It says in the word, provision will be there, healing will be there, transformation will be there, and a place where only victory lives. Wow. Yeah. I was like, come on, God. 
come on, God, a place where only victory lives. You know, and I was reminded, we were talking the other day, I was reminded that, that Churchill had on his desk when you came in to sit in front of him, defeat is not an option. I want one for my desk. You know, because when you come in, people are carrying stuff they shouldn't be carrying. Defeat's not an option. This is a place where only victory lives. The spirit of praise declaring war on the enemy. Chaos outside, peace inside. Watering holes along the way for people to drink and a true sense of belonging. You see, people want to belong. They truly just want to belong. They, that's why they join this club and that tennis club, this club. They want to join because they want to be, they belong. And the Kels motto, as you know, was belong, believe, become. Very often we want them to believe before they come through the doors. Why don't they just want to come and belong? And then start looking at you and going, gosh, I want to believe in the God they believe in. And then they become all that God's created them to be. I love how he said in the word, which you will read at some point, that the warriors of war will be forged in the fire of his presence. Forged in the fire of his presence. These warriors come in. And then the Lord bends them and moves them through the worship, forging them in his presence. They will carry, he said, the fragrance of Goshen, and they will go in and out of these hubs to the land of chaos, eyes ablaze with my love, he says, forgiveness on their lips, bringing hope and life from a place of humility to the broken brothers. Listen, there's a few broken brothers out there that need Jesus, that need to come back in. It's up to us. He said he's raising an army of those who were once lost. Ooh, I cannot wait to see those guys return because when they return, they're coming back with fire that will probably put us ashamed, make us ashamed. And all from the hubs of habitation. And our only job is to focus our face. He says at the end of the word, focus your face like flint. Knowing that he has need of us. So I believe that We'll go naturally, supernatural more and more. I believe that he's calling us to spend time in the hubs of habitation. I will give Jackie the word because it's an important word, I believe, for the way ahead. Hubs of habitation where only victory lives. So when you came in here this morning like I did, feeling a bit defeated, beat up by the enemy there, I don't know what was going on in the middle of the night, but hey, but I'm empowered by his presence, as soon as the worship started. Whew. All that stickiness of the web that was trying to get on me just started to dissolve in the fire of his presence. We're going to be forged. Forging is not easy, people. You know, you're stuck in a heat, and then you're beat. <laughs> Come on, oh, forged in the presence. Oh, I'm so forged in the presence, you know. Yeah, yeah, he's going to beat you. <laughs> it's going to take some things to get beat out of you. <laughs> it is me anyway. But that's it. You see, we're forged in his presence. Will you make that so romantic? And it is romantic at the end. <laughs> when you look back, it wasn't that bad. But yeah, it was going through it. It was bad. Because he's, he's sticking and bringing you out. You ready? Beat. Not quite yet. Oh, and again. Shh. what it's like people until he gets you free and who the sun sets free is free indeed and we're a free people amen, amen. thank you <laughs> yes let me stand with me please I want to honor Apostle Jackie and her team and City Gate and everything that you're doing here. It's immense. Let that settle upon you. Immense. The Lord would say there is an immensity that is manifesting itself in and through this place 
that has the magnitude and the density to impact a region and a nation beyond all proportion to size, The Lord is asking me to remind us of a phrase that he gave to me some time ago. As individuals, don't chase the spectacular at the expense of the significant. And there's a significance here, an immensity and a density of a spiritual atmosphere. And I hear the word flood. Flood. This is a floodplain. A floodplain. Hell has no insurance that will protect heaven's floodplain. For the Lord says the river's about to burst its banks. There'll be a manifestation, saturation of Holy Ghost power. Immensity. Father, I pray that that would soak in to our consciousness here today, immensity. Hmm, thank you, Lord. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For those gates that seem to have remained shut, have only done so until the waters of the lock have risen to the level of the ocean outside. The Lord says they are now beginning to open because the waters of the Spirit have risen to the level of the challenge within you. And I see you sailing through those lock gates, rising higher and higher and higher in the Spirit, And the Lord says, this is not a pleasure cruise, but you are a battleship. And the Lord says, you will fire a broadside at the broad way. You will fire a broadside at the broad way that leads to destruction. And the Lord says, I am teaching you to carpet bomb the enemy's landing strips. And the Lord says, as you listen to me, there will be the finest accuracy that will be brought to bear upon those positions of the enemy and those landing strips in the spirit that the enemy has exploited, they will be so pitted with pockmarks and spiritual shell holes, it will be impossible for the enemy to land or take off. 
And the Lord says, do not be distracted. Keep focus. There is a time to fight the smaller skirmishes and there's a time to ignore them and march on to the greater prize. And I will give you the wisdom to know the difference, says the Lord. And I also hear the Lord saying that I have not come to bring peace but a sword. And the Lord says, I am gracing you in this hour to weather the turbulence of relationships within your family and outside your family, to hold fast, to hold course. And as unpleasant as turbulence is, there is a redemptiveness about the discomfort that your presence will bring even to family members and the world around you. But the Lord says, hold fast, because in the end, there shall return a harvest of righteousness upon the godless, and they will change in a moment, and that quite suddenly, and beyond even your expectation, even though you lack not faith, the Lord says you will be surprised by the suddenly of the turning of those who opposed you. And the Lord says, hold fast through the turbulence. Hold fast through the turbulence. There shall be no shipwreck. There shall be no breaking apart. But only the finalization of my purposes, says the Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. You may be seated. I'll try and be as quick as I can without sacrificing any of the precious things that the Lord has placed on my heart today, but immensity. If you forget nothing else that I say, please remember everything Rose said, but if you forget nothing else, if you forget anything else I say, please remember immensity, immensity, immensity. You know, this is the year of the open door. This is the, to do with the mouth, the open door, the decade of the mouth. And, you know, I, I have quoted it very often uh, this last while. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, from the King James Version, or just for Beverly's benefit, the King Jim Version. <laughs> for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. But Paul doesn't stop there. He continues... And there are many adversaries. There's a difference between realism and defeatism. Realism sizes up the task in front of us and says, along with the two that brought the good report, they are bread for us. Defeatism sides with those who are of the ten and says... We are grasshoppers in their sight, and we are not able. Yes, we are able, because if we continue on the path that the Lord has set before us, and He orders our steps and directs our paths along those narrow pathways, then anything that is in our way is bread for us. Did you understand what I have just said? I hadn't planned to say that. It is of the Spirit. When you're, on your, when you're on the path of righteous accomplishment, being directed by the Holy Spirit, then anything that is on that path that opposes you or blocks you is bread for you. Because it opposes not you, but the very authority of heaven. I feel impressed to say it again. Anything that is on the path of righteousness that the Lord is directing your feet to follow, that impedes your progress or opposes you, is bread for you. There is nothing that is impossible to God through you that would raise its ugly head that you cannot decapitate.
And decapitate does not mean it replicates. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Well, listen, fire burns with oxygen, does it not? You suck the oxygen out of the atmosphere, you'll get no fire. But I tell you what, if you have the oxygen of optimistic prayer, the fire will burn just fine. But it's hard to be optimistic, as Vance Havner said, if you have misty optics. How are you looking at things? Where is your perspective? You're above only and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. Your ability to see far beyond into the future excels and exceeds anything that which the enemy possesses. And you can see the victories on the horizon where he only sees defeats for you. But those seemingly moments of defeat are but learning lessons and springboards to the future success of your call and your destiny and when he threatens you, like the Persian and the Persian king did the Spartans, our arrows will blot out the sun. The Spartans replied, good, then it will be nice to fight in the shade. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me as we were sitting here this morning in this wonderful atmosphere. Thank you so much, Jackie, for you and your team facilitating a thin place, an open heaven, a portal of power. The Lord said this to me, there is coming the largest concentration of spiritual authenticity and authority that the world has ever seen displayed through my body. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Whether things in heaven, things on earth. And this is what the Lord highlighted to me today. Things under the earth. For the Lord says, even here, there are underground networks that have been forming, that have been concealed. But the Lord says, no more. For I am bringing exposure for you to see what has been growing and manifesting underground. And the Lord says, I have called you to be ones that zero in under my direction and my leadership to those hidden places of enemy networks for the purpose of supreme elimination. And the Lord says, I am giving you x-ray vision to see beneath the surface of things to the lurking hidden things that lie beneath. And it's almost as if that when you see them and you see really what drives them, it's not going to be a gasp of astonishment of how massive it is. That in the spirit, with the authority that you are clothed and mantled with, you'll find yourself saying, is that all? Is that all? And that's not a place of pride. That's a place of astonished humility at the greatness and the presence of the Lord as He commissions you afresh to see beneath the surface. And that's what I'm sensing. I'm a, I must make progress. So I, I want to talk re, uh, briefly, very briefly now, about the weaponization of thanksgiving. Not your turkeys and ham and uh, the other things that you'll find later on this month on your table. And my goodness, that's weaponization at its best. You know, uh, I, I could almost import Psalm 23 if that's not blasphemous. He has prepared a table before me in the presence of my foes. We feast, he falls. And maybe there's something prophetic in there that as you gather around with your families, that all the agitation and all the, uh, the stuff that surrounds the previous 12 months from the last Thanksgiving until now, you feast and you say, no, we're going to feast and the enemy will fall. And all these things will evaporate amidst the surfeit of turkey and, and ham and all of that. But anyway. Way. I do with that what you will. It's not a thus says the law, but it's a healthy anticipation. <laughs> yes. 
1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you or for you. And I have never felt such a, a, a presence of the Lord upon this scripture as I do in this season for the body of Christ. In everything, in everything, in everything, in all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And it does not say for everything, but in everything. The weaponization of thanksgiving is a much neglected part of the spiritual armory of the uh, warrior in Christ. And I want to begin where it ought to begin. That everything has a beginning, and its beginning is in the grace of God. And I, I now refer to Ruth in the book of Ruth. She was a foreigner and a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, yet by her alignment and by her choice and by her proclamation, she became adopted into the family of God. And so astonished was she that God and his family adopted her, a Moabite, that she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing as I am a stranger? And if we have nothing else in this life to thank God for, and if that was the only thing for us to thank God for, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that would be enough until eternity rolls. You can tread on all the demons and cast out all the enemy that you like. And Jesus said, don't rejoice in these things. Rejoice in this, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And so even on your worst day, that entry in the Lamb's book of life is still there, indelibly marked with indelible ink in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your name is written, and you can get up in the morning whether you feel glad or sad, and you can say, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. There's so much more (laughs) that flows on from that entry into the heavenly scrolls. But you see, thanksgiving is a habit. It's a discipline. It's a decision of the will. It's an act of worship. It's all these things, and it has to be cultivated. Thanksgiving is a muscle that must be developed by exercise. How are you getting on with that? If, If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Now think now, pause for this moment in time, pause for the last 24 hours, and think back. How has your thanksgiving been? Please keep a straight face. I don't want to know anything about it, and (laughs) I don't advocate poker, but there is such a thing as a poker face, and you can keep a poker face without letting everybody know how your last 24 hours have been. How has your last 24 hours been? Your last week, your last month, have you weaponized thanksgiving? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We think the will of God very often is the important stuff that happens out there, the spectacular stuff, the shifting of the tectonic plates in the spirit. It means nothing if you have an attitude that is not one of gratitude. Because if you drop the weapon of thanksgiving, you are very vulnerable. And the devil knows it. And I've got it in my notes if I get to it. But if I don't, I want to say this right now. The devil knows that when you grumble, you will stumble. But he also knows that if you can remain grateful in the midst of the hateful, he's already lost. How is your thanksgiving? How is your thanksgiving? And thanksgiving matters most when we like it least. Somebody gives you a big gift and it's wonderful and all the oohs and the ahs and the goosebumps and the soft focus and all of that. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. It's meaningful. 
but it's not necessarily that powerful because the motivating force has been something that has done to you rather than the powerful motivating force when you can't find a single thing, naturally speaking, to utter thanksgiving and you find the, multi, multi, the motivating force is actually resident on the inside of you. And when everything seems to be going, we have an expression, pear-shaped. I don't know whether that's sort of, a, it means the circle has kind of dropped a bit. It's, 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 not, it's not complete. Things are just going wrong. How about that? Is, that? is that a better way of putting it? When you can find that motivation of thanksgiving on the inside of you, something explodes in the spirit. There is a detonation of destiny being fulfilled. When you can raise your hands or the enemy tries to put chains on you like he did Paul and Silas in Philippi and they began to use their chains as percussion instruments and they lifted their hands and they praised God in the midst of the deepest, darkest dungeon and they released their thanksgiving because it actually says in Psalm, I think it's 119, I can't remember the exact verse, but it says, at midnight I will rise to pray to you and give you thanks. And I have no doubt whatsoever that when Paul and Silas were in that dungeon, that scripture was powerfully imparted into their spirits by the Holy Ghost. It's midnight, Paul. It's midnight, Silas. Come on, you know what to do. Yes, Lord, we'll rise and give thanks and we will praise the Lord and everybody in this prison is going to hear. And do you know what happened? The Lord sent an earthquake. The Lord is well able to rearrange the furniture around you and the geography and the territory. <laughs> you know, you, you go out into, I, I don't think in North Dakota or, or Montana where you can see your dog running away for three days, but it's so flat and you could travel a hundred miles and swear you hadn't gone anywhere and the fuel tank's kind of getting towards empty, but you know, I, <laughs> but you can go to other places where there are hills and there are mountains. And do you know how they were formed? Because the tectonic plates and the lava and the pressure on the inside of the crust of the earth, the molten lava, shifted the crust of the earth's surface and bunched it up and rippled it. And so you saw the mountains being formed. And listen, when you and I are feeling flat because the enemy has tried to crush us, you must know, you have to know that still within those oppressive moments, the molten lava of thanksgiving is ready to ripple the geography around you and create those mountaintops of high praises to the King of Kings. <laughs> and I tell you, you can stand on those mountaintops in the midst of adversity, and the world thinks you're insane, but you see it in the Spirit before it manifests itself in real time. And there's something hot about you, burning on the inside. And there you are in the midst of adversity, like Paul and Silas, giving thanks to the Lord when the devil thinks he has you as a prisoner. Thanksgiving is weaponized, and suddenly everything begins to shake and quake, and the doors swing open. And the reason why it is so important, as Rose said earlier on, it's not really about ourselves. It's about modeling something for those who come after. But it's also more than that. Because if in a moment of despair, you could mobilize thanksgiving, you will change the spiritual atmosphere forever in that moment. Nothing will be the same again. Your perspective will not be the same again. The enemy's power will not be the same again. Nothing will be the same again. And so we have to learn to see it from heaven's perspective. And it's like a, 
an ink in a syringe, uh, the fluid of ink, and try it. You take a clear patch of water in a bowl or a basin, and you take that, what do you call it, syringe or pipette or whatever it is, the thing you squeeze on top, and you drop a single drop of ink into that water, immediately it fans out and spreads and colors the entire mass. The ink of thanksgiving will write on the pages of time the story of your destiny and that of those who follow. Because there is a ripple effect. That as you make a decision in the Holy Ghost to be thankful in the midst of the hateful, something happens in that moment that can never be altered. Did you hear that? Can never be altered. It can never be altered. It remains on heaven's statute books that heavenly legislators respond to the thanksgiving of God's people in those moments of confinement and adversity. And even as the supreme judge's gavel comes down and makes that sound, heaven rules in your favor. Psalm 100 says this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Not just on the sunny days, but in the storm-filled days, the difficult days, especially in the storm-filled days, especially in the difficult days. More significant then, more powerful then, because it becomes a sacrifice. The fruit of our lips, a sacrifice of praise. <laughs> it's not sacrificial, as I said before. I'm, I'm just going back to remind us of it. It's not really so sacrificial if you have been blessed beyond measure, we have an expression that your socks have been blessed off you. you, you they blow your socks off. The, the power of the blessing, it, it, it's almost an involuntary thing, you know, uh, you know uh, a sacrifice of praise. It, it's not even a sacrifice, it's just an involuntary response. But a sacrifice of praise means something that costs you. And the fruit of our lips in those defining moments at a particular juncture and our pilgrim journey through this snake-infested world, those defining moments when there's every reason not to be thankful, and we produce that sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips. You watch the fire of heaven fall on the restored altar of a consecrated heart. But the word thanksgiving here as many of you, maybe all of you know, is toda, which means to extend the hand. Just do that with me. Just indulge me. That This isn't praise aerobics. It's not, you know, <laughs> slim to scripture or anything like that. It's... Uh, <laughs> We have the products over here. Um, <laughs> I'll see you at the table at the back. Uh, no, it's, but extending the hand. So you get the idea. Toda, thanksgiving. Extend the hand. Now, Rose and I went to see Esther in uh, Branson at the Sight and Sound Theater. If you haven't been there, I thoroughly recommend that you go. It's absolutely wonderful, worshipful experience. The excellence there is praiseworthy, all to the glory of God, and such a timely message when you consider what's going on in the Middle East. But there, we know the story. And I'll read it 
actually uh, from chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Now, it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house. Let me, let me say this. The whole point of Revelation is not for us to be spiritual tourists <laughs> taking selfies, you know, next to the throne of grace or, you know, look at this and getting the angles right and woohoo, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with the angels. It's not about that at all. It's about entering his courts with purpose, clothed in royal robes that he has fashioned for us and standing in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Which meant life, not death. Because she came in unannounced. And should the king have been displeased, she would have been executed. But her boldness, approaching the throne, allow me a little license here of grace, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, That was one of the scriptures that was given to these wonderful children. There was life as the king extended his golden scepter. And what was Esther's response in that moment? The Hebrew word is different, but the implication is the same. She went near and touched the top his scepter. Toda, extending the hand. When you come in to his gates with thanksgiving, you're extending your hand in the courts of his favor to touch his authority on behalf of others or your situation because it involved Esther also. Thanksgiving appropriates favor. In fact, think Thanksgiving is the chip and pin to your credit card of grace. And without favor, you will flounder. But with favor, you will flourish. Thanksgiving secures that favor. How are you getting on with Thanksgiving? I remember many, many, many years ago, late 90s, I think it was, and uh, Brother Jerry Savell was ministering in Belfast, and I attended that meeting. And at the end of his message, he made an altar call for people to come down, but he made it a very narrow category. And he said, only those who are full-time in Christian ministry, we're all full-time in Christian ministry, but he meant, you know, this kind of pulpit thing and pastoring thing. Only those who are in that kind of full-time ministry, I'm going to invite to come down. And I desperately wanted to go down and have him lay hands on me, but I couldn't because I wasn't in the category. And integrity wouldn't let me pretend either. You know, we have to have a fear of the Lord that some things are in his timing And so anyway, many, many people were going down. And I could feel something unhealthy just rising on the inside of me. It was called jealousy. It was uncomfortable, but it was, it was growing on the inside of me. And the Lord said, Kevin, what are you going to do with that? And I paused. And I said, well, do you know what, Lord? I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to give you thanks for every single person that goes down and receives ministry and the laying on of hands. Because I said, Lord, to the degree that they get the increase, I get the increase, because we're all fitly and compactly joined together. And I could feel joy rising up in the inside of me. I tell you, it wasn't but 10 days later, there was a prophetic minister that was ministering in our church, And he pointed to me and he said, you, sir, will you stand? And he said, the Lord says it's now time for you to go full time. The Lord was showing me something. 
and it was a test, and I passed that test. But thanksgiving mobilized the ministry of heaven in that single moment that knocked that domino down until 10 days later or thereabouts, destiny arrived at my door on time. And you can transport that in any which way you choose, into any circumstance of your life. The power and the weaponization of thanksgiving is immense. And I'll finish with these two scriptures. The next one I'm going to go to is Second Chronicles. I'm not even sure, Beverly, whether I gave this to you. If I, if I didn't, I do apologize. But it'll make it all the more thrilling when I surprise you with it, won't it? I, I, you know, I, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 21 to 22. And we know the situation that Ammon, Moabites, and the Mount Seir, and all the enemies of Judah uh, were invading, and the situation looked very bleak. In fact, worse than bleak. It was, it was really catastrophic for them. And so there was a fast, and there was seeking the Lord, and there was praying, and all that kind of thing. And the answer came. You're not going to have to fight this battle. The Lord is going to fight it. And uh, just believe and prosper. Be established in this prophetic word and the order of the king, and it's all going to turn out okay. Easier said than done, of course, but they believed it, and they, they imported their faith into that moment of destiny. We're using that word a lot today, but I can't get away from it, that destiny, that point of destiny. But you know the thing that really swung it? And this is in the NIV. It says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. <laughs> I, I, I was choking the other day and I thought, yeah, I'm in the choir, you know. <clears throat> I sing in the choir. See that ministry, everything? I sing in the choir. I've got a good voice. I can sing. Oh, you do too? Yeah, I'm a tenor. Well, I'm, a, I'm an altar and uh, I'm a baritone. Yeah. Yeah, we have our fine robes, and every now and again we put on a show, you know, Christmas time, there's a show, and everybody comes, and it's wonderful, and we have mince pies and non-alcoholic mulled wine art. It's great. You should come and join the choir, seriously. Can you sing? Yeah, we'll try a few. Yeah, okay, come and join the choir, great. There's a place for you. Somebody moved away, we need to fill it, great. I'm in the choir, you know. But on that day, I don't think anybody wanted to be in the choir, because you have the armed troops behind you, the ferocious enemy with mass weaponry in front of you, and the king says, choir, choir, I need you just at the front here. That's it. Come on. Uh, what are you doing? Where are you going? Yep. No. Over here, please. Thank you. And there they would be. And you imagine it on that day. Okay, I want you to start singing and praising the Lord. And this is what you are to say. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. I don't care whether you're a world-class baritone or a soprano. Your voice would be quavering on that day. It wouldn't be, give thanks to the Lord. It wouldn't be that. It would probably be more, <clears throat> thanks the Lord for His love endures forever. <laughs> and I guess that's why in the Psalms it says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> but as they release this faith-filled sacrifice... In the presence of extreme danger and catastrophe, something began to happen. Heaven respond to the healthy sound of thanksgiving that began to flow, not from the lips of the fearful, but from the lips of the downright faithful. And it says, as they began to sing praise... Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Yeah. 
Remember how we started? A great and effectual door has opened unto me, and there are many. Give thanks to the Lord. For his love endures forever. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. His love endures forever. His love transforms you from a coward into a conqueror. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Fear is cast out and faith flows because of the love of God. And I'll finish with this. Thanksgiving brings supernatural peace. But supernatural peace is not the absence of turmoil. It's the authority that cancels that turmoil. And in Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And it's not just a, oh, everything's going to be okay. It's much more than that. It's a military term. It means to garrison and guard your heart. And so thanksgiving, when you correctly understand this verse, is thanksgiving is the usher that seats peace on the throne of your heart. Thanksgiving is the usher that says, come on, peace, come on. Kevin's going through something right now. Come on, he's giving thanks. Come on, peace. Okay, you're powerful, you're mighty. We're going to seat you on the throne of Kevin's heart. Jehovah Shalom. On the heart of the oppressed. And something happens in that moment. You are no longer the oppressed, but in the peace of God, you become the oppressor of the enemy. Because Paul says it in Romans 16, 20 about peace being a weapon. He says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Stand with me. And as we're standing at the conclusion of this, this message, I want us to be reminded of perhaps the greatest spiritual warfare verse in the entirety, in my opinion, in the Bible that says, and we know, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. Which more or less says you cannot lose. And so thanksgiving mobilizes scriptures like that. I thank you, Lord, that I cannot lose. I thank you, Lord, that all things are working together for my good. You know, I, I happen to believe that I am actually a reverse conspiracy theorist where it doesn't matter what is happening in the world around me, that I do believe that God in His wisdom and He is mobilizing creation to conspire to turn out redemptively for the people of God and that the devils and the demons are nothing more than subcontractors for the people of God and His grand plan of redemption. For we know that all things are working together for good. And so we can say, I'm so deeply grateful and blessed that all things are working together for my good. Come on, let's begin to give thanks to the Lord wherever you are, whatever circumstances you are going through. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Lord, that no one is going to snatch me out of your hand or the Father's hand. I will never perish. Thank you, Lord. That I can stand on my high places like a, oh, like a, a mountain deer. You have caused me. You're teaching my hands to war and my fingers to fight.
The praise is rising up on the inside of me that thanksgiving is being weaponized right now. Oh, and I say in the name of Jesus, this situation, that situation, that circumstance, it's all now coming around for good. And I praise you, Lord. You are so good. You are so wonderful. You are almighty. You are powerful. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, everything is working out for me now. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Oh, I'm ahead and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you. Oh, Mama Rabasiki Shedadadeva. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to you, Lord Jesus. Oh, glory be to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, praise you, Lord. Jackie, I don't know how you want to finish this, but I tell you what, there's a mobilization of thanksgiving. Wow, wow, wow. What an incredible message, even to follow up on what Bradley released last week, because he focused in on, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord in everything, in everything. I had leaned over to Rose and I said, years ago, the Lord said to bring your prayers and requests to me without thanksgiving is like trying to deliver a letter without a stamp. <laughs> that'll, that'll stick with you for a while. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for being here. If you have not taken the opportunity to give, we want to be sure that we bless Kevin and Rose and their team as they return home. It's such an honor to have them here and to have all of you here with us this morning. So do that. The uh, chest will be up here for a little bit longer if you would be so inclined. And Beverly will put up the uh, QR code as well because we really want to bless them abundantly as they return to Ireland. So let me pray over you and wish, just bless you. I bless you all with the love of God. I bless you with the presence, with the very presence, manifest presence of God, that wherever you go, you carry his presence to shift the atmosphere. That as your mouth is filled with gratitude and thanksgiving, as your mouth is filled with praise to the living God, that you shift the atmosphere and you cause the glory of God to be revealed everywhere you go. I decree over you, your history makers, to change the world around you. So, Father, I bless your people, and we bless you with thanksgiving. Lift up a shout, love on somebody, and we'll see you next time. God bless.